Thanks all for coming today, and you're so welcome to the parade tower in Kilkenny Castle. Uh, we used to have our own home across the way here, so we used to do events here regularly, so uh, really nice to be back here. And so we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Arts Festival and also the 80th anniversary of Butler Gallery, um, founding of Butler Gallery. So um, I'm hoping that most of you here may have been to see the exhibition. Um, and uh, had the opportunity to, to do that uh, and are a little informed of the artists that uh, we've gathered here today. Apologies in advance for the change in the lineup, which was out of our control uh, due to life colliding with people's schedules. And I'm delighted that Mandy O'Neill graciously stepped in to replace Andy Fitz, who very suddenly was left repairing a damaged sculpture for an exhibition uh, coming up. So, uh, sport and art are two of the most universal languages we have. They enable us to express ourselves physically, emotionally, and even intellectually, allowing us to connect and communicate with each other around the world, crossing borders, cultures, languages, and generations. It has been a real pleasure researching this exhibition and looking to the many artists who found themselves filtering ideas about sport into their work. The results are sometimes surprising, but always innovative in their approach, very much demonstrated by the three artists we have joining us here today. A painter, a photographer, a dancer, filmmaker, all showcasing art of substance, grace and beauty. It'll be interesting to learn uh, how their approaches differ and possibly overlap. So let me kick off by introducing you to these uh, three talented practitioners featured in the exhibition. Uh, so bear with me just a few minutes when I share some of their significant career highlights. Um, Fergus Oconcour on my left here is a choreographer, dance artist and artistic director. Brought up in the ring Gaelthoc in Ireland, he completed degrees in English and European literature at Magdalen College Oxford before training at London Contemporary Dance Studio School, frequently collaborating with artists and experts from other disciplines. He's a champion for what dance can help us understand about how we live in the world. His film and live performances create frameworks for audiences and artists to build communities together. From 2018 to 2020, Fergus wa uh, was the artistic director of the National Dance Company Wales, uh, where he focused the company on making work with and for all kinds of people in all kinds of places. This included premiering his work, and I won't even try to say it, it's Welsh. Estedford? <laughs> okay, there you go. Yeah. Uh, Estedford, and bringing it to Japan as part of Wales' cultural programme around the Rugby World Cup. Uh, we'll hear a bit more about that later, no doubt. Uh, drawing on Gaelic games and the communities involved in them, Abu, the work on view at the Butler Gallery, uh, beautifully celebrates film in and the, the, in film, the commitment, care, and passion uh, it takes to make a strong team. The dance honors not only the stars on the pitch, but also um, the people who are, aren't always visible and are, aren't always included. And the choreography is by Fergus with filmmaker Luca uh, Trifarelli with music by Morley Bow. Film was made for the Step Up Dance Project 2022. Mandy O'Neill is an Irish visual artist based in Dublin. She's currently a PhD candidate in, uh, at Dublin City University, where she also, she's also artist in residence from 2019 to 2021. She has an MA in Public Cultural Studies from the Institute of Art, Design and Technology, and a BA in Photography from Dublin Institute of Technology. Her work has been exhibited widely, both nationally and internationally. She was the winner of the Zurich Portrait Prize in, at the National Gallery in 2018. Her images are held in public and private collections. School, recent commissions include a public art installation at Gwales Galvara Primary School Dublin, which no doubt she'll speak of later, uh, Central Bank of Ireland, the Digital Cub, and the National Gallery of Ireland. Her current uh, research considers the themes of place, belonging, and perception through a long-term case study of the inner suburb of Cabra, Dublin 7. Her wider photographic uh, practice is drawn on themes of youth, adolescence, and education, with particular emphasis on portraiture. In the last number of years, she's undertaken extended artist residencies in schools and institutions, and her work produced engages with the physical and psychological space of these environments, coupled with the interplay of people and place. Her work seeks to examine the wider structural, social, and political context within which institutions operate, and particularly those tasked with the support and development of uh, children and young people. Uh, Colm Machelok, I'm sorry, Colm, I always mess up his last name. Why don't you say it, Colm? Machelok. 
you got it. <laughs> also from Dublin. <laughs> Thank you, Colm. Studied at the National College of Art and Design and uh, St. Luca, Brussels, where he is now based. He has studied and worked with master printmakers of both the Graphic and the Black Church Print Studio. He was co-founder and co-director of Monster Truck and Studios in Dublin. His earlier career as a printmaker, illustrator, and musician informs his painting practice. He exhibits extensively and has works in a number of important public and uh, private collections. His large-scale works are based on photographs sourced from sports photography, specifically images that capture the finishing stages of races. The paintings in the exhibition, uh, Sprinting Man Left to Right and Sprinting Woman Right to Left, takes a new look at picture production. The first is based on a photo finish image from his archive, the second was produced by AI, with words prompts based on the opposite description of the first image. In this way, they work as mirror images, the analog photo giving birth to the artificial image. Colum's exploration of the processes of image production open up new approaches in painting, setting new parameters and approaches to representation. So no doubt we'll hear more of that later. So may I first uh, turn to our speakers and ask each of you to give us maybe a brief synopsis of your practice, and specifically, I suppose, to expand upon your reasons of incorporating uh, sport imagery into your practice. What was the drive, motivation to focus on sport in your work? I'll start off with yourself, Fergus. Thank you, Anna, and thanks for having us here, and thank you also for having dance in such a wonderful exhibition, because I think one of the important things for me as a dance artist has always been a kind of recognition that um, historically, we say in Ireland that oh, we haven't been very good with the body. I mean, we've had bodies all of the time. It's just we haven't really um, maybe had a language for articulating our relationships with it, or we've had narrowed kind of ways um, because of our particular ideological, religious, cultural legacies. But one of the ways we have had of expressing ourselves is through sport. I know that that's not for everyone in this country, and it's not exactly the same, and that there'll be different sports but I certainly grew up with a really strong GAA background. Um, now, I didn't, as, as Anna kind of said in my biography, I, um, I grew up in the Ring uh, My family, which includes my mother, my cousins, my aunts, my uncles, my brothers, my sisters, all play. Uh, I've got a brother who's a sports journalist, another who's a sports physio, my cousin, uh, she won all Ireland's for Cork. Like, it's just, it's everywhere. And I've never played uh, um, team sports. And I think you could say that that's because I was a gay man growing up or a gay boy growing up in Ireland and that maybe that environment wasn't entirely comfortable for me. Um, but equally, I think it's also my disposition. I'm an introvert rather than an extrovert. Um, and yet, that sporting environment, I, like physicality, running through the fields, playing, running, all of those sort of things is really, it's, this body was made for sport. It's, mm -hmm. it's, that's my DNA, that's my heritage. But I think what I communicate to my family is that I just use that heritage in a different way. I've changed it, I've transformed its possibility. And when I discovered dance, and particularly contemporary dance, it was about discovering a language that could help me imagine different ways of being of forming my own physicality, but also different ways of bringing people to, together. Dance is about arranging people in space, in time, in motion. Um, and so for me, contemporary dance is a way of imagining how we could be together differently. But it's very interesting to look at sport as one of our cultural inheritances that helps organize us. It organizes the people on the pitch, but it also organizes all of those supporters, those people around it. It even organizes those people that don't want to be involved, but have to navigate the traffic on match day, or have to <laughs> find something else to watch when it's the World Cup. Or like, we're, we're all, you know, it it's, has enough heft in this country to, to organize many of our lives. And so for that reason, it's an, an obvious place to start. Um, Tell me if I should stop talking. No, that sounds stop great. Talking? That's great. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so it's part of who I am. It's part of my physicality. In 2006, the RTE, RTE commissioned um, a series of dance films, Dance in the Box. And with Dervla Walsh, I made a film called Match, which was a duet um, for two men uh, that was filmed on, on Croke Park. 
And for me, that was very important because uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, I'm the first person in my family that's performed on Croke Park, so <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, but also, uh, it's interesting because I knew that in Ireland we sort of say, oh, contemporary dance, I don't really understand that. I don't understand it. It's like, it's, I don't understand it. But people watch people being physical um, with a kind of an exchange of emotion, with social impact, with psychological uh, uh, forces driving them. They, they watch that in sports all of the time and they know how to read it. So by me putting my dance on Croke Park, partly it's about claiming a space. It's about saying we, I also belong here. Um, I might not have been before, but I, I belong here. Um, but also it's saying, you know how to read this. You know, you know what's happening here. Mm -hmm. So um, when it came to making Abu, which is a piece, I will fast forward, uh, which is a piece that we made in 2022 with the Step Up um, dance company. Step Up is an opportunity for early career dance artists, most of whom will have trained abroad, um, to come back to Ireland and reconnect with the community here. Because the risk is that we lose that dance talent when it trains abroad. They will have built their networks in London or in Germany or wherever they are. So it's easier for them, dance being that kind of mobile international thing, to keep going. So we bring them back. And um, one of the things that was important to me as well is that we would connect. So Abu was made with, uh, in Limerick with local GEA clubs, um, with county players, with a variety of different people kind of informing the dancers so that we could put in that performance, which is actually, first of all, a live performance that we, di we do, and I hope we will continue to do on, um, on pitches. It's something that connects and that people can see themselves in, but in a slightly different way. I, I could use the word queer, as in to turn and see from a different angle. I think that's what I'm trying to do in the dance all of the time. So, but also to do it in a respectful way. I want people to recognize themselves. So if there are people who are committed to sport, that they will see and know that we have heard them, seen them, mm -hmm. but also that we have revealed something to them that they know was there, but maybe that isn't always made visible. So I think that's, that's probably what's happening that's in Abu. And there I, I think we'll come course. back to that also in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Mandy, uh, can you share with us a little bit of your drive towards sport or your involvement? Okay. Um, well, I'll say at the, my practice at the moment has nothing to do with sport um, over the past few years. So I'm actually going to go back in time slightly because when you asked me to give this talk, I started thinking about my relationship to sport and the... As I was saying to Colm earlier, my, I'm more kind of sport adjacent rather than involved in sport. Like I've never played any sports, always been kind of terrible at sport. Um, but as it turned out, when, when I left college in the mid 2000s, um, I ended up doing um, a certain amount of work for SARI, which is a Sport Against Racism Ireland, mm. um, and started getting asked to cover like football <coughs> matches and basketball matches. And I always kind of thought, oh, you know, sport, I'm not really into the match. But then when I actually went to do it, and just what you were saying, um, the idea of the choreography and the people kind of fl flying through the air and the, the movement and the facial expressions, um, so I would kind of always miss the goal because I was more interested in the, mo sorry, the movement of, of people. So I found that really, um, it was really energetic. And the thing as well, because it was school sports, like it's very much amateur, um, a lot of it is about, you know, it's about the children, it's about that friendship and camaraderie. And um, for some, I, I ended up later on then working in schools and a lot, it really wasn't about the competition, it was about the, you know, it was, it was about going on the bus to the match on the day and singing the songs and, and such like. Um, and then in 2007, I had been walking around the city near where I live. and I came across this boxing club on Dorset Street called St. Saviour's. Um, and it was just a big metal door and I was just intrigued by, you know, what is, what is in here? And I knocked on it one day and they let me in. So I asked if I could come back and, and photograph at a certain point. And I still remember it to this day. It was a Thursday evening, um, like seven o'clock, and there was some kind of tournament on. 
And it was really small because it was a really old building. It's been refurbished since. And the place was just absolutely packed to the rafters. It was just sweat dripping down the walls. The smell, <laughs> the noise, uh, the blood flying. And I think, I mean, there was very few women there. Um, they didn't have the facilities for female boxers in the club at the time. But I was terrified. And I just, you know, I, I attempted to take a few pictures, but they were terrible. Um, but I ended up coming back, and then I ended up actually coming back for over two years and spending time in the club. Um, and just that, you know, even the trainers, the older trainers in their 60s and 70s, and the relationship they had with the young people, um, there was just something just really beautiful about it. And it was, it was right in the middle of the kind of Celtic tiger when it was starting to wobble. Um, and it was just that, that simplicity and that purity that, you, you know, the boxer, because there's quite a loneliness there as well, the, the singular. Um, so I ended up doing a series of portraits there. And, um, and again, like a lot of the places I end up in, I'm kind of still friends with them and I've gone back. I went back then nearly 10 years later um, and photographed some of the female boxers. So that was, that was a particular project. And then I worked with a number of um, female athletes. Um, and actually, I noticed, Anna, that you mentioned in, your, in the Irish Times article that you would have loved to have a, a portrait of Katie Taylor. And um, as part of a commission, I was commissioned by a certain body to do a, a portrait commission a couple of years ago. And we spent a full year trying to get uh -huh. Katie Taylor. <laughs> Because oh, wow. I really desperately wanted to photograph Katie Taylor, but it just, she was so busy and it was, it was yeah. so elusive and it just didn't happen. Um, so yeah, and so I photographed quite a few kind of younger female athletes, uh, Radisha Akadeli, I think. Um, she's, she recently, I think she recently uh, broke some kind of record for, for Ireland. Mm -hmm. So. But really, I was more interested in, in them as portraits mm. rather than the whole uh, sport connection. So then, just moving on, um, I suppose toward the, I think it was around 2013, I started a series of uh, artist residencies in schools. And one of them was at a, a Gale school in Cabra, a primary school. And I mean, sport, music are at the core of, of the Gale school, and particularly sport. Um, and at the time, the school was all contained in prefabs, like really just kind of rotting, mm. falling apart. Mm. Um, and the pitch, so the pitch was bigger than the school. And that was just situated literally in front of the, the prefabs. So a lot of the time, even classes would take place on the pitch because, you know, you want to be out of these kind of smelly, mm. dark classrooms. Um, and I spent four years with the... Um, children of Girls Go Barra. Um, I've also been to Crow Park to see them play on, you know, to the Aran Islands, to and many, many school buses. Um, and then just to, to the work that's in the show, that's actually, those images were taken on another artist res residency in a secondary school off Sean McDermott Street in Dublin. And again, they have a huge gym. Um, I mean, I didn't go in with the premise of taking, you know, sporting pictures, but a lot of the time is spent in the gym, and I ended up spending a lot of time there. Um, so another thing I would say is that I became really interested in the architecture of sport. Um, mm, yeah. You know, the the oh, nets yeah. and the, the markings right on the ground, the um, <coughs> yeah, just just the architecture, and then and also even just you know the pitches and those wide open spaces. So. Yeah, I think I'll probably leave it at that now for the okay. moment. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. So, Colm, far away. Sports. You've been just, we, I caught you at a good time. You were involved with a, a body of work that was addressing runners and sports. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it was a lovely coincidence, in fact, actually, because it's not something that I've um, explored that much in my work at all. Um, I might just start going back a few years um, to where my practice, I suppose, um, has been informed. So I think, as you mentioned, my, my biog, um, I worked as an illustrator for, for many years in Ireland, in Dublin. I was, a, um, I was kind of a caricature artist and I did a lot of uh, political satirical stuff for the Sunday Tribune. So for six years, this was my first job after graduating from art school, um, which was incredible just to have a, 
uh, employment after graduating from art school. It's, a, it's quite a rarity. Um, so it, I, I never gave it that much thought, this idea of um, um, contributing to the kind of circulation of imagery in the world. And that's, that's essentially what I was doing uh, as an illustrator and being part of the, the media machine. Um, and I suppose I would have had ex access to so many different topics that I was working with and themes and working with a lot of writers and all the rest, journalists. Um, and it wasn't until I, many, many years later when I decided to pursue art professionally as a career and kind of gave my, my practice a lot more consideration, I started to think back about this, my relationship to the, the mass-produced image. Um, so photography was, of course, always my source um, for years. Uh, I'd, I'd have access to either Googling and taking bits and pieces from the web, from the web and you know, filtering it into my paintings. Um, and it just made me think about this kind of slowing down of the, the, the process, what painting does, you know, kind of it, it really slows down our, 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 our way of perception, our way of looking. Um, and I, I, yeah, this, this is where I, I kind of fell in love with different kind of photo, actually started even looking at different types of photography, in fact, um, and giving it a little bit more consideration than it was ever in, in meant to be for. So um, I, I ended up, Working the last few exhibitions I've had, I suppose, have been dealing with different types of photography. Um, I worked with um, war photography for one exhibition in particular, looking at uh, photography that documented the war uh, between Israel and Palestine. And I contacted some photographers from both um, parts of that world um, and just wanted to kind of uh, bring to the fore the, the question of, of uh, political positioning, I suppose, behind war photography itself. Um, the image is taken, it goes, it's, it goes to the press, and it just disappears into the world, and it can be reinterpreted in many different ways. So I found, yeah, I found the ambiguity within photography very interesting, and I found painting was a way for me to kind of halt down the process of looking, and I could really scrutinize a photograph. Um, and this, yeah, I mean, this, this, this for me was kind of a lovely, it gave me a lovely conversation between painting and photography, which historically has a very interesting kind of relationship anyway. Um, so jumping forward a little bit, um, I found myself just, you know, looking, looking at different types of photography that would really inspire me um, and catch something. Um, and I've discovered this type of photography called photo finish. And it's a system, um, I'm sure everybody is aware of it, but it's, it's, a, it's the camera system that kind of travels along at the same speed as the athletes as they come towards the finishing line. And its, its main purpose is simply to um, you know, take, a, take an image of, and decide who comes first, second, and third. So what it does is, it, 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 as, it, as it moves along at the same speed as the athletes, it blurs the background, and it, it kind of naturally kind of distorts the figure itself. So um, I mean, this is not meant to be looked at in any other way other than first, second, and third. But I mean, if you look at it through an artistic you know, alternative lens. There's something really beautiful, and um, and I suppose it, you know my approach to the topic of sport um, wasn't the, the, it, I suppose as a interest in sport itself, but I think as we all touched upon it, it was what sport can do for us and what it can do for the body. And um, for me, it was like kind of looking at this incredible capturing of this the physique of the human body, like now caught in a moment in sport, um, and. And also, I suppose, like kind of the the the, the, yeah, the usually athletes when their photograph has been taken, the last thing that's on their mind is that their photograph has been taken. They're in the middle of this mm -hmm. incredible moment of focus. So there was just something extremely powerful about um, this type of photography. Um, and incidentally, I, I, I cycle quite a lot as well, and I compete in races. So I, I've, in the last few years, I've become a lot more into sport. And one of my cycling buddies um, is an ex. Um, 1500 meter sprinter, he was in the Commonwealth Games. So we'd spend hours together on the bike and as I was researching this body of work, I would be picking his brain and he was just telling me the, you know, these incredible anecdotes about the, the mental preparation for races and all the rest. So it, I suppose it, it definitely added a lot of weight to, to the subject for me, like you know, uh, researching it. So it's ent entertained me for the last year at least, and I think I will yeah, continue with it for... And the oversized quality of the paintings, I mean, making the figure larger than life, I mm. suppose that's something that, that's obviously yeah. something that you bring to it as well. That's yeah, I mean, it, it's funny because like those, the original image that I would have taken that from was like a, a that size, like a tiny mm -hmm. screen grab. So I mean, it's it's uh, and uh, it's nice to kind of like kind of 
expand it and make it gargantuan, almost like, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, also the athletic physiques are incredible. I mean, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're like Roman statues in mm -hmm. some ways, like, you know, mm -hmm. so. Brilliant. I suppose the first thing I'd throw out to all of you um, is that, you know, while I've been thinking about sports for a long while, I've been moved by so many artists, and I think I mentioned uh, before that Paul Pfeiffer and Josh Begley, those two works in the show were kind of the instigators of, of, the, of the work, and it's been, I've been mulling over it for many years, but it just seems like perhaps we're, are we tapping into a cultural zeitgeist of the moment? You know, are, are, is, you know, sports seems to be everywhere in Ireland, and it's doing so brilliantly for women in sports. I'm really proud to see uh, how well women are doing uh, representing Ireland out there. Is, is there something underlying our whole system here in Ireland or the world internationally? Ireland just seems to have a, have a big presence and part of our lives, and that obviously has... has uh, drawn you to incorporate that into your work? Do you think it's some national psyche that we're, we're participating in as well? No? Or it's just all of you individually came to it the one day and said, yeah, I'm into sport? Um, I think for me it was just being adjacent to it and it, it's just happening. And there is definitely, in terms of women in sport, it has escalated. Um, and I thought it was quite interesting. My a friend of mine who is an ex-sports journalist and who just came back from the Women's World Cup in Australia. And she mentioned that, just thinking about my image of Amran in, in the show, that it was this World Cup is the first time um, there has been a hijab-wearing um, mm. athlete in the, in the World Cup. Um, one of the Moroccan players, I think. Yeah, so, um, so I think, yeah, I, sp I suppose it is. It's, women's sport is kind of coming more to the fore. Um, but having said that, and we still have that conversation, like if you think of somebody like Katie Taylor, as phenomenal as her mm. achievements have been, she still doesn't really get as much coverage as the, you know, the male mm. boxers. Um, but yeah, I suppose that's just, just a point of note. Mm. When I was listening to you, and I, I think, because you mentioned Girls' School, but I know, um, I mean, I know it's sort of an accident, but actually Gaelge is, um, so I, I grew up in the Gaeltacht, and I think having grow, grown up with two languages, I'm always aware of being the kind of need of a translator, um, as in the person who carries things from one space to another, but also the strap line for Tichi Kahar when it came on is Sulele, another I, another mm. view. Mm. And it feels like that some of the things that uh, I guess are artistic practice, is allowing us to bring another eye to mm. what is a, like I, I think about sport as a, it's a cultural practice, um, but in a way, particularly when I'm working with maybe non-professional performers, one of the ways I develop work is to give them a task, because by doing the task, they begin to reveal themselves, but they need to just be doing the task. I'm not asking them to reveal themselves, I just mm -hmm. ask them to do the task. And sport is like a task. It, it has, there's a very clear goal, it sets things up, but that, um, that set of actions uh, also allows other things to reveal themselves if we're willing to look at it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what we are trying to find mm -hmm. different ways to actually encourage all of us to sort of see, oh, but this is what's going on. And the reason I say that in relation to, I mean, whatever sport you take, whether it's boxing or um, soccer or GAA, you can look at it and see cultural change mm -hmm. by looking at that frame, like at the frame of sport. You look at uh, who gets to play. I mean, it's really interesting. So I picked a, that, the film Abu is made on a hand GAA pitch, but it's with um, Erin, the young woman in it, girl, is from uh, a hand Kamogi. And the Kamogi team in a hand is um, it, their uh, county champions, but the senior women have to wait until all of the underage GAA players ha have done all of their training before they will get onto pitch in the evening. So there are things that are revealed. Um, mm -hmm. E just, e and that's in a club where it's, the relationships are very amicable, it's all that. It's not a one club, but it's, a, it's very amicable. Um, but there's something about, I think, us being able to use whatever artistic practice to kind of reveal something that's already present, 
um, and maybe bring it to the foreground in a way that, yeah, I guess that, mm -hmm. that I feel is our job. And maybe also, yeah, I think my job as an artist is not only to reveal, but also to model. So it's also to practice what it could be. Mm -hmm. So the selection of those performers is very, it's very deliberate. The location is very deliberate. All of the sort of things, I feel like the choice of subject is very mm -hmm. deliberate. It's a reflection, but it's also an amplification in saying this is what the world could be. So it's very much a collaborative um, act that you and, Bo and Mandy are doing. I mean, Colm, you're the more solitary role in the studio and you and the computer and your paint and whatnot. Yeah, but I mean, having said that, I mean, I've... I think maybe just, maybe just myself, whatever. I I I can't stay in a studio, <laughs> like so, uh, you know, for a long period of time. It's very unhealthy. I mean, it's just like, and if you're you're not really moving around, and as you said, like I'm, I'm a physical person. Um, I definitely need to uh, burn off energy. And I mean, I come from a, a sporty uh, family. There's my mom over there, who's a, you know, a, <laughs> a phenomenal athlete in her in her age. Um, and so I think it's it's kind of it's in me this this need to to also be physical so I, I mean I clock up a lot of kilometers like during the week cycling and mm -hmm. it's it, it's also kind of a solitary sport as well in, in a way and um, but that's I think that's it's it became very interesting for me to really kind of think about this subject as I was working with it like you now with athletes and having a lot it just um, I mean nowhere near the discipline that they would have but uh, but also understanding the discipline that they must have in order to do what they do um, and it's it's hugely inspiring but mm -hmm. It, it doesn't surprise me whatsoever that there, you know, that something like sport would have a huge pull again. Mm. I mean, particularly if you consider like the last few years that we've all been through, like now kind of globally, and um, it's stuff like sports um, that can actually just, you know, kind of remind us that we're, you know, we could be unified with this kind of uh, in this pursuit either with a team or with an individual, uh, pushing ourselves beyond the, you know, the limits. Um, it's hugely inspiring, like mm. you know, and you kind of, you know, I. I think this is where sport and I would say art and music by yeah. extension um, are sort of art forms and practices that are massively important I think just for the for society in general like mm -hmm. you know to kind of rally together and people know. were yearning to get together after COVID yeah. to yeah. go to a match and have yeah. that group uh, joy just yeah. expressing that joy but yeah. you have music in your background as well and that's more of a I guess a team yeah. act as well. So that would have been something that you know you know how to work with people as well. That, yeah. that to yeah. bring to the work. Yeah. Oh, I mean, again, it's also an individual and and a group pursuit because like there's a lot of kind of solitary hours practicing, and then you get to enjoy then in a, an ensemble or whatever. But um, yeah, there's yeah. A, yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Could I? Yeah. Sure. Just to say that, like when I'm talking about team and building communities, I'm thinking about it from the introvert perspective, as in. It's also about claiming the space of the introvert in a community, and that community doesn't mean everyone like having a big old party together all of the time. It can be the people that are on the side or passing through quietly. Um, the the image that when we were making um, Abu, um, I went to see the Napiritik, which is a big club in in Limerick City, and they have a lot of pitches just on the in Caradavan. Um, and I went in an, of an evening where there were lots of underage training, like little matches and all of that training going on. The, all of the pitches packed, the divided up, all the under 12s, under 6s, like there were loads, loads. <laughs> Mammies and daddies in their big Range Rovers, um, <laughs> the big lights, all of that on. But they have a lot of pitches. And then out on another, on the kind of one of the far, further pitches, there was a young girl who was just practicing on her own. Mm -hmm. And um, a team is made up of all of the people. The people, like it needs. It needs the people who, have, who are doing those solitary hours, the person who's going to step, uh, step up in the moment of most pressure and carry everything and take that one shot that's going to change the mm. match. So it is something about the, the kind of finding a place for all kinds of difference. That, like, that's the kind of team I'm talking about. Mm. Um, because I think that when I grew up, I thought a team was just all of those lads. <laughs> that kind of wanted to be together and I didn't fit into that one. Mm. What I'm doing now is I'm saying, no, I'm going to fit into yeah. this as well. And I suppose as a choreographer, you're really aware of people's bodies and the what they have to give and what they're they're bringing in, you know, their, their strengths and their weaknesses and how to, to shape that into a dance and also shape that within a game itself, yes. as, a, as a coach would. Yes, as a coach would. 
it's interesting because you talked talking about the space and the architecture. Mm. It's it's about bodies, but our our bodies are enabled and disabled by the environments that we perform in. Yeah. Um, so um, much as I would like to have. Uh, to work with dancers with difficult, different physical abilities. If we wanted to film on a pitch, a wheelchair doesn't work very well in a pitch. Mm. So you, you have to think about a different, like what are the environments that enable bodies in different, uh, to enable bodies mm. to work? And, and that applies to all of us, you know, whether, you know, I'm wearing my contact lenses, I'm, I am, my body is augmented. Mm. augmented. We can think about different ways of augmenting bodies to reveal or enhance their potential in different ways. I'm, I'm kind of curious. From for me, it's it's that next level of thinking how we are going to be together, and sport will continue. I like, you know, I don't know anyone who's watched the Paralympics, and particularly wheelchair rugby, and like those. There's nothing, <laughs> nothing kind of careful or safe about wheelchair rugby. It's like people bashing into each other in wheelchairs mm -hmm. and falling out and getting back in again. It is thrilling. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's something about recognizing that uh, different environments will reveal different kinds of possibility. Mm -hmm. And Mandy, with you working with children and that, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a real leveler in a way with ages and uh, boys, and men and women, and boys and girls. And, uh, and how do they respond to you as an artist coming in? Was that a, a difficult relationship to uh, nurture and, and uh, grow? Or was that a good one, dealing with the institutions and then the children separately? Um, well, I think I was lucky with the institutions that I approached. Um, and it's inter interesting, like with the girls' school, uh, the girls' school was actually at the bottom of my road where I lived. Um, and it was always, because the pitch is kind of facing out onto the road, and it was just always full of kids just milling around and the noise and the kind of vibrance and, and the colour. Um, and I just approached them myself because I just felt, I, I need to get in here, I really want to photograph this, this energy. Um, and then when I met the principal, he turned out to be just this extraordinary kind of... Uh, just the ethos of the school is contained in the way he mm. runs the place. Like, it's very free, it's, it's a bit wild. Um, sport, music, um, like, the, these kids will just sing or dance at the drop of a hat. Um, and it's not about the competition, it's very, um, it's very much a, is about, like, just, just doing it, like, just give it a, give it a go. So when I, when I arrived initially, I was, um, yeah, because it's, it's, it's quite a wild place as well, so the kids are pretty wild, and it was like, well, who are you, and are you with the newspaper, are pictures going to be in the newspaper, what's this about? And then I think they were really disappointed, and I said, well, no, I'm an artist, and I want to try and do, and haven't photographed anyone famous, um, at that point anyway, but, uh, <laughs> so they were, they were really interested, and especially the smaller kids, I mean, because I, I was standing in a playground, and they're just milling around, um, mm. and I, that's kind of what I do, I don't go in with the purpose of I'm going to make a particular project with this class or they're going to make something with me. I just kind of hang around. Mm -hmm. And that was all a bit odd. Um, you know, who is this woman in the playground with the camera? Um, so eventually I kind of focused in on the older children and I worked with a particular class and I got to know them and I would sit in on the classes and I went to the Gale talk with them twice and nearly froze to death on in a year, I think it was, in March. Um, so yeah, we kind of, I suppose, yeah, they, they just got used to me and eventually it was like, oh, it's just, you know, I'm just there. Um, and it was, such a, it was such a beautiful school and actually I learned probably more from them just in terms of ch chilling out and l just letting things happen. But then when I went to work in the secondary school, which is a Daesh secondary school off Show McDermott mm -hmm. Street, and it's all teenagers, and again, it's pretty intense, and it was a totally different experience. Um, they were all from different backgrounds and countries. Yeah, it's, I think it's one of the most multicultural, if you like, uh, schools in Dublin. Yeah. Um, but also there's kind of, you know, people from the, a lot of people from the inner city. Um, so there's a kind of suspicion, um, you know, and also teenagers, so don't take my picture, like, you know, uh, so it was much more intense, and it wasn't this, I had this kind of, I don't know, romantic idea or kind of from working with the younger children. Um, so it was quite intense and a lot to negotiate. Um, but I kind of backed off as well, and I, let, I, I, I respect their, 
need for, for space. So it, it took a lot more time and um, yeah, just kind of slowly to kind of gain people's confidence. And then I, I ended up working with smaller groups. Um, yeah, but it was just very, and th that kind of started me thinking about that whole relationship that teenagers now have to photography and the image mm. and how they kind of, they want to control. So, and I kind of started to see to that control then as a, as a photographer. And some of those photographs from that, that body of work of yours, which I've seen on <coughs> your website, um, the kids were, or teenagers were gathering together within the gym or the, the pitch or yeah. whatever, um, and somewhat protective of each other. And I just wondered, is this a place that they find to hang out? Or it, it, again, that level, or is it something that helps them come together no matter where they're from in the world? That they can either play basketball or they can, they can kick a ball around or not? Or? Um, I think it is, and there's a huge gym attached to, that, to the school. Um, and they would have a lot of kind of matches of people coming from other places. And so it's on the match days, and there's quite a lot you would have those groups that are just kind of, you know, they're mm. out of class and they're just there to support mm. the team. But really it's just, you know, it's just an excuse to sit around and kind of, you know, be with their friends mm. for a while. And I have some of my favorite pictures that I've ever taken are those, they're not choreographed, but you know, when you just manage to capture a certain group together and the gestures yeah. are all just so kind of flow together. Um, they're really wow. difficult to capture, but they're, yeah, and, so, and often people are just off in their own world and stuff as well. So there's, mm -hmm. yeah, the gym is kind of at the core of, of the school and also, also because the school building is quite oppressive in terms of its architecture, yeah. whereas the gym is more, there's actually more light and yeah. it's more open. Um, yeah. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, do you want to say something, Fergus? No? I was just, the, the only thing I was just going to say, or maybe put a, a mark, because it's sort of interesting we're talking about sports, but you mentioned gym, and what comes to my mind are also like gyms, and now the increasing place of the gym, the leisure centre, in, in kind of people's social life. I, was, I went to the watershed just around the corner here at the weekend, and there were clearly people, like, I mean, it has the swimming pool, and it has the, the kind of fitness gym, and... Um, but there were people that were gathering because they were a team that was going to do some training, but there were all the families bringing their kids to the pool. Like, it, it's interesting mm. to think about that as a cultural space as well. It does seem like young people these days are, well, maybe, you know, growing up, it's less about, you know, madly drinking. It's more about looking after your body and uh, being healthy for the future, which is yeah. kind of extraordinary. It's great that that's the, uh, that the mindset of them now. Uh, Sorry, I interrupted. No, 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 I was just like... With, yeah, as you were talking about just kind of um, kids, because I, I taught in schools for, for many years as well, and it was, um, I'm kind of just reminded of this idea um, that when you participate in sports, you, you kind of can't be self conscious. I mean, there's, there's something amazing about the fact that sport forces the individual to lose that, that, that sort go. of idea mm -hmm. of self consciousness in order to kind of participate. So there's something, I mean, I'm Possibly why I'm drawn to kind of imagery of sport is the 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 the, the physical kind of movements that come out of sport mm -hmm. are so free and it's really it's, it's just quite beautiful actually like you know mm -hmm. so and I love how that has an effect kind of in a in a sort of mental way with uh, particularly kids I suppose in schools when they're doing it you know. Mm -hmm. Will you continue to work with sport in the future? Um, yeah, I. I think I will. Yeah, I mean it's funny. I know. I know. I mean, with a series, I'd normally kind of, ex will, I'll work on it until it's exhausted, and I'll move on to another. But there's um, the AI aspect of the that, that the work I have in the exhibition is something quite recent, and that seems to open up a lot of yeah ideas for me now at the moment. Anyway, this mm -hmm. idea of the the analog phot photograph having a dialogue with an artificial generated image as well. So yeah. I, I have a question for Colin, because yeah. um, I noticed I was looking at your Instagram and actually you talked about your own like need to go out and do the training, and I was just noticing every now and again you don't do it a lot, but every now and again there's um, there was some photographs of you blurred um, with this <laughs> new with the new series of, yeah. uh, of but what it made me think about having met you was also you're turning digital images into painted, so through your own physicality mm. it becomes a medium. So I'm kind of curious about yeah. that, the place of your own physicality in the, in yeah. the image making. It's funny, well actually I, I started to 
uh, pick up photography again this year um, for the first because I've been working with photography, I suppose, you know, indirectly with my work. But for some reason this year, I just took up the camera, I picked it up, and I've been very conscious of actually taking photographs, uh, creating my own kind of uh, source imagery as well, um, and kind of falling in love with the medium itself, actually. So, um, and I think because of that, I probably just pose and take a the odd selfie in the studio. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I don't know, yeah, guilty. Do either, any of you have questions for each of you before we maybe hand it out to the audience? Say some people have some questions for us. Um, I might have one question for you first. <laughs> um, like you mentioned, the, the thing of being an introvert and then working with these groups of people, and that's something that I absolutely identify with. Um, and when I started out, I mean, I just had this absolute compulsion to take portraits, but I was terrified of people. Um, and sp big groups and institutions and it was like some kind of penance or something but I had to kind of force myself to um, into these situations if I wanted to take the, the portraits that I did um, and you think that's some kind of way of as an introvert of maybe engaging with the world or engaging with people because you're still kind of on the outside but you get to be in the it's like you get to be in other people's worlds for um, for a period of time, um, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I would say it's very selfish. The, when I talk about you know designing worlds, I am trying to design a world that I can belong. Yeah. And when, like, when you talk about being in the schools and like just being in the like kind of waiting there long enough or going back often enough mm -hmm. so that you can be in that boxing gym or be among the running around. Yeah. Like, you just take your place and then everyone accepts it. And I. I love the idea that in the future that there'll be some of those kids that kind of go, oh yeah, I, actually I could be that person that just kind of hangs around with the camera for a bit. I don't really know what they do. Like, yeah, I could be that yeah. person. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because there will be so many other options that are revealed to them. And I think, uh, yeah, I think it's important that we signal to everyone, to the extroverts and to the introverts, that we, there are ways that we and work productively together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Kind of extraordinary that the GAA let you into the Crow Park to make those dance pieces, which are It was complicated. Amazing. Because, yeah, we, um, uh, yeah, initially they were like, you can't, uh, you can't, um, they were reseeding, and the, so the grass was growing, so it would be gorgeous. Um, but, and it gets most <laughs> caught up around the goal mouth, and they were like, you can't film in the goal mouth, and we were like, okay, grand. That's going to be tricky since the whole, like, the direction of the choreography is towards the goal, but you say, yes, of course we won't. But the great thing is that the groundskeeper was there and he saw us doing what we were doing and he was like, you have to do that to the goal mouth. And we're like, yes, we do, <laughs> thank you. But, like, so it was great that he recognized the kind of aesthetic necessity, but, or whatever the drive was, he recognized it and we were able to do it, but yeah. What does it take to get permission to do something like that? I mean, oh, it's like, yeah. jump through hoops to the make, fact, yeah. Yeah, or the fact that it was commissioned by RTE helped. Okay. Um, so we used them, uh, we used, it's like It's called Match, everything. isn't it? It's called that Match. That People should check that out yeah. on, on uh, Fergus's Ooh. website because it's pretty powerful. Um, and Abu is wonderful too. I love that there's a place for everyone in sport, you know, and, and to see it through dance, photography, and all of the different mediums we have in the show, that uh, hopefully everyone will see themselves through that work. And perhaps we might uh, open it out to the audience if there, anyone has some questions for any of the speakers here. Be grateful to hear you. There we go, we've got somebody up front here. Catherine, here we go, we're going to have the yes. roving mic. Thank you, thank you, I wasn't expecting the mic. Um, Anna, I just wanted to, I have a few comments actually, because it's been extremely thought provoking. Um, all of the different elements that you have touched on. But Anna, going back to a question that you asked earlier about why sport is so prevalent in our lives now, you know, mm -hmm. and I definitely identify as somebody who is adjacent to sport also <laughs> <laughs> and always have been. And I suppose I was thinking back as to my connection with sport and why um, a, a fear of sport, I think, maybe a, a fear of, you know, when I was going to be picked <laughs> from that, that lineup, the dreaded lineup. Um, but Anna, I was thinking about that, and maybe an element to it is about how sport now has become so commercial as well, and mm -hmm. it's televised um, because I suppose uh, you know stations know that they're going to get the viewership, and uh, there's an art also in finding the game 
mm-hmm. as I know from watching my husband trying to find a match on TV. <laughs> Where is he going to source it from, you know? Um, uh, there is an element to that, I think. Um, and Colm, I just actually had a question for you in particular about your uh, AI-generated um, image. And uh, um, it's meant to be a mirror image, isn't that right, to... Uh, yeah, to yeah. the to the work that you have, mm-hmm. um, uh, I was thinking about how uh, you are taking something that is so fast moving, slowing it down, as you said, with paint, and uh, uh, that reminds me of I think ancient artists. Even like ancient art has been, you know, doing that with, you know, like the disc thrower going mm-hmm. back to to Greek art and uh, how something in motion is being mm-hmm. captured and slowed down for the viewer to mm-hmm. observe. Um, but I was wondering, could you maybe talk a little bit more about the AI-generated uh, um, piece and its place in the art world as well, and maybe how you see mm. AI art um, having that place in, in galleries uh, in the future? I'd be interested yeah. if you could. Um, for sure, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hot topic at the moment with, uh, with, in, with photography as well. So, um, but I feel that uh, AI in art, um, in, in some, in, on, one, on the one hand, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a hyped tool, you know, that people have just le- leapt on. It, it's kind of, it's also called, caused a huge fraction within the sort of the way we've always enjoyed and received art, you know. Um, it's also become um, an accessible tool for a lot of, for for everybody really, like you know, to kind of uh, play around with it. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with any of those things. I think like these, it's important for the visual world to get a, a shake up every now and then. Having said that, um, it's still only a tool, really. I mean, I, I never, I don't think it would ever really fully replace kind of what the, an artist or you know a visual person can do. And in some ways that my decision to create that diptych, those, those two paintings, was my response to how I use AI. Um, there, was, there was also something else. I mean, I like this idea of working with the, an analog image, which is the, this photo finish image. It's a very functional image used by a machine. Um, and the idea of describing the opposite of what that painting is to generate a, a mirror image with AI. So. Um, it's, it's almost like I'm stepping back and I'm allowing an analog image, you know, give birth to like an, an, an AI image as well. Mm-hmm. So, and essentially that's all I, all I did was I intervened with some words, you know, so. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's, it can be, it, it, served, it served my purpose, you know, in, in creating like, you know, two paintings that have a sort of dialogue with one another now. Mm-hmm. And it's, um, yeah, and you can make it what, you can really shape it what you want it to be, you know. <laughs> But it's an interesting question, yeah, with AI. I think everyone is entitled to use it at their, you know, whatever way they want to, you know, I suppose. Yeah. It's good that the two paintings are in conversation with each other, that they're doing different things and creating a dialogue, and um, we shouldn't be too afraid of it, I suppose, AI yeah. out yeah. there. Um, uh, anyone else with some questions out there? Eamon, I'd be surprised now that you wouldn't have a question. <laughs> but, oh, here we go. Oh, did and they're they're so wonderfully complementary to the exhibition. I was really thrilled we didn't miss them. Oh, good. Um, but I'm wondering how did you have a lot to choose from from the IFI? I or wish I had we... been had a chance to get in there myself. That was uh, it was something I'd asked if I could access the archive to choose them myself, but that wasn't possible because they weren't in a format that I could. So Suniva O'Flynn from IFI who knows the archive inside out. She was the one who put that program together. And it is part of this program, Local Films for Local People, and these archive films go back to the 50s. And while they might seem terribly old-fashioned, they really do create a fabulous context locally for people to see when people are being taught how to play camogie or to hold a hurl or whatever. And. Um, <laughs> uh, they and these paramount pictures of, of, of old Ireland. So they're a bit of a they're 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 just a, a nice way for I think uh, also people locally that would 
ch check in with the All Irelands and would know a lot of, more of the material than I would myself. But I really liked it as a, not an antidote, but as, as an addition to the exhibition, where exhibition is very much a, a contemporary and showing what artists are doing today, but in film, in the uh, archive films, to show what's, what people have been capturing in their daily lives throughout the last couple of decades, I thought was a nice uh, addition to the theme of the, of the show. And I think for me what was interesting was that the films, just having seen them so recently now, things that you've said here are absolutely mirrored in the, there's one about Caltex, the, the technical yeah. art competition, and uh, the narrator says about, and maybe we should be looking at it through the eyes of the children, you know, yeah. and they, they focus on the children's paintings. It was just, yeah, there's some very interesting images in it that are reflected in the talk today. That's great. I'm glad you get to, you went to see it because I'm um, trying to encourage people to, to spend the time and spend the hour or so because it's a really valuable, you get an awful lot back from it. Uh, there we go, Eamon. <laughs> Can always rely on him. Thank you, Eamon. <laughs> um, Anna, this is a question for you. Oh. <laughs> well, you did ask. Come on. Um, so obviously, I mean, Paul Pfeiffer was possibly the genesis for this exhibition in many ways. And you've got a great exhibition there that traces from international artists like Paul Pfeiffer or Le Brocchi up to artists like Sarah Walker, who wouldn't be that well known outside Ireland. Yeah. What was your sort of thinking in terms of those artists, in terms of selecting who, which artist is going to be in the show? And I guess the more awkward question is, was there anything you, didn't, you weren't able to get? There were plenty I wasn't able to get. And, and very much... Um, and there were plenty by Paul Pfeiffer I couldn't get. I mean, someone of that international um, status, you're looking at what, you know, originally his, his gallery, his gallerist is in the New York, and they're the people I knew and I, from my years of living and working there. So I contacted them originally, and thankfully they put me in touch with Thomas Dane because the technology is different from the US to the UK. And what Thomas Dane, his gallerist in London, had available to loan, then I did look to see whether private collections that would have more of uh, the images that I was seeking, difficult to get. So ultimately, what I got was what was available to me. Um, there are so many more aspects of his work that I really, really like, but I knew from the, and, and he's done many retrospectives and uh, continues to, to make really extraordinary work. Um, but, uh, the, the, the rumble in the jungle, the, uh, the rumble in the jungle, the long count, uh, one of three films that he made about Muhammad Ali and various uh, fighters, um, that required quite an amazing setup. You know, you have to adhere to the artist's um, uh, needs for how it is shown, and especially difficult in a in a group show to to give that much space, but that's the only way that one could see it, but, um, uh, and, and that we would be, have permission to, to use it, but uh, it does get complicated. And there, some of the films that I would have seen would have demanded the whole gallery been dedicated, to be dedicated to the, like Renica Dijkstra has the, the, the photographs about the gymnasts. There's a, a film that goes along with that, and I, that would have been wonderful to show, and maybe in the digital gallery, no, can't, wouldn't be allowed to do that, would have to be on a giant screen. So there's sort of reasons around not being able to include. I had like pages and pages of, of artists and lots of other Irish artists too, but to have something that would work together in a group show, decisions had to be made at some point or other and some had to go aside. I think overall there's a good um, uh, overview of, I, I, I like that there's, Photography, sculpture, I mean, there's, there's other sculptures. Um, Andy Fitz, if she had been here today, she has these tiny little miniature um, fishing men, uh, people throwing out, and uh, they're just amazing. And I would have loved to have included them, but they were out at a show. So every time, you know, you might have an idea of a particular work, but there's something that might get in the way of that. So in the end, while you have a very ambitious idea of what works might come together in a great way, there are other things that get in the way of that. So I, I think we were lucky to, uh, to uh, and there's an awful lot of work to get, you know, a painting by Marcus Harvey across from London to here or from, you know, the US to here or Paris and whatnot. But uh, um, yeah, I don't know, that 
answers your question, does it? It does. It's yeah. a beautiful show. Ah, oh, thanks. No, this, great. Yes, far away. Ian. And, and there's a question up here too, yeah. If you look back over the history of art over hundreds of years, many paintings uh, evolved or de revolved around religion. Now that we've become a more secular society, sport in many ways has replaced religion in developing, sustaining, and nurturing communities. And people are more loyal to their local GAA club than they are to whatever faith they were brought up in. What do you think is the role of sport in nurturing, developing, and sustaining a sense of community? And I think that's for our speakers here. I think, Fergus, maybe you could you know, hit, hit up, kick off with that because you, with your teams that you... I mean, it, yeah, it's very much about, I, I, I mean, that, that's what I'm looking at sport as, is a, as a way. And, and as we were saying before, that in organizing community, there will be people that don't feel they belong to that community, and that still organizes them, because it organizes them in the not, like the kind of not necessarily central part, and that we need to expand our sen sense of communities that can involve people in different ways. I think the GAA is quite smart at that, and for anyone who knows, then the kind of drilling down into ladies football, why is it called ladies football? Um, but ladies, <laughs> ladies football and camogie and all of, like the power involved in that. I, I was just thinking when you were talking about organizing and religion, like we think about the impact of the Catholic Church on reproduction in this country over many years. I know, and not very far from me, but like there will be families who are desperate that their child is not born in December, but is born in January. Like do not be early because that child is going to be at a disadvantage uh, by being a young one in their, in their kind of cohort, in their age. And we do know that actually, you know, children who are early in their year, uh, who are young in their year, are at an educational disadvantage, educational and sporting disadvantage. So there are families that will be making sure that, if at all possible, please do not induce that child it's the last thing until I would have thought. January. Thank you very much. But like, those are the ways that community are actually formed in practice. So we can talk about all the kind of loveliness of how we come together and how we celebrate, but there are actual physical, like practical things that sport organizes us. Um, and you know, we could look at that in, yeah. in other sports as well, but yeah, I, that's I, what I'm saying. It's true, no, it's, a, it's an interesting point, like what you make. Um, I, offer, I also feel that like something like yoga has also kind of replaced a sort of sense of spirituality, spirituality in people's lives. Um, sea swimming as well, you know, yes, I mean, it's, it's up there with self-flagellation, like, you know, if you're, if you're into the, those January cold uh, <laughs> swims. Um, and, you know, and, and some of the, you know, and also maybe like some individual sports uh, versus group sports as well, it, you know, it kind of feeds into the individual's need for something, you know, it's like the... A way of belonging. The loneliness of the 100-mile mm -hmm. runner, you know, this yeah. stuff is, so... Yeah, one of my favourite films. Yeah, and this, that, sort of, that sort of idea is like, you know, that, you know, it, 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 it could be sport in many ways, or whatever it is, exercise, or however physical you want to be, can nourish you in whatever way you wanted that to be, you know, so, um, yeah. We have a question over here. Oh, hi. How are you, Clint? Oh, sorry, it's two here. Yeah. I've got one, get you after. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, you talk about AI being the new tool. There was a recent controversy when an AI picture sneaked into an exhibition. I'm wondering, is AI the new impressionist? <laughs> when they came along first, <laughs> they were frowned on. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to see that Fergal, a Gael Gore from the ring, was welcomed back into the hallowed ground of Croke Park. <laughs> I'm very surprised to let you interfere with the sod, though. <laughs> <laughs> Just when I have the mind, there's a, an old question. When was the last time the All-Ireland was played on English soil? And we'd all go back to 1920, 22. But after one of the recent concerts, the groundsman was a formal groundsman in Arsenal, and he imported sods <laughs> into Croke Park to fix the texture of the soil. But people can sleep easy now. They bought their own farm in meat. <laughs> Irish beer. Irish, Irish So to, uh, to go back to my question, AI and Impressionists. Is it like the new Impressionists? Well, I suppose uh, the Impressionists were, they came about um, a, a, as a reaction to a classical painting and the, the Beaux-Arts, you know, so, I mean, and it was also uh, challenging the way that we perceived the world around us. Um, 
there was, uh, so I mean, in, with AI, I don't know, it, it's a far more integrated into our world, into our digital lives. It's very difficult to just to pinpoint it. It's just an artistic thing. I don't believe it is. I think AI is, is everywhere, you know. We're not even aware of AI. So um, I think it's something that, you know, but maybe it, it's interesting that for that reason, um, because it affects art, it, it's, it, it includes art in the greater world experience as well. So we all have to deal with AI in one way or the other. I don't think it's uh, let alone art, yeah. It's here to stay. Did you want to <laughs> ask a question? Hi there. I'm at the disadvantage of having come to the talk before seeing the exhibition, because I've just landed into Kilkenny now, and I'm really looking forward to it, so thank you very much. Um, listening, there seems to be a bit of romance about the take on, on sport, in a sense, just from what I'm sensing here, um, from moving to, you know, it, 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 um, replacing, say, religion, say, or or that sort of thing, or the hallow ground, the GA clubs, and getting into Crow Park, and finding programs on the television, you know, the, the matches on the television. I, th there's that whole, and maybe this is in the exhibition, I just wondered in relation to the selection, and uh, both of the artists and of you, Anna, as, as um, the, the selector, the curator, the director of the exhibition, um, so much of sport is about failing, Mm. and trying, and as they say, the matches in Crow Park, to bring that back, are all won in November, in the dark days of November in the club, um, mm. as, as, as they say traditionally. But that notion of the failing, and get, picking up and going, which is something actually that is very, very much mined in the commercial ads that go on in mm. advertising um, around, particularly in the GA, and, and yeah, particularly in the GA. And I just wondered, is there that for me to look forward to in the exhibition too? Well, and there is how one that might be done. And then just on that as well, is, are there other minority sports, such as, say, fencing or... Um, well, I, I, I think it was very clear from the start that this wasn't going to be a tick box of ev every sport. It was just going to be looking to artists and what particular artists were making work about sports. So it wasn't right trying to cover everything you know, golf and whatnot, and it was uh, seeking out the work first. But there was, there is one piece in the show by Josh Begley, the concussion protocol film, which is quite negative look and timely look at uh, uh, the uh, American Football League and the 280 concussions that were undertaken in one year of the NFL. And this film also was something that was really that really moved me, that, that kept, kept bringing me back to the content of sport and the pros and cons of it. And so what Josh Begley does in his, is that film is that he highlights that and he makes us think another way about safety. And, and also, you know, in relation to a lot of the, the, the players in the NFL, all African-American uh, athletes, uh, that are undergoing these big contracts, but safety isn't at the core of what they do. Similarly, in, uh, in Paul Pfeiffer's work, uh, with the, the uh, camera obliterating the fighters, you're usually then looking at the white audience, looking at the black player. And um, uh, so a lot of these artists are, 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 are highlighting issues in, in, in Fiverr's case, very uh, uh, in, a, in a way that you have to scramble with and find for yourself, whereas Josh Begley's film is very in your face. You know, you see these, these players tumbling back. He does this incredible thing with the backward um, movement of the, uh, of the player falling and the helmet coming off, and there's no way you, you cannot understand what, how clear it is about this being um, a part of sport that needs attention and is a topic of, of debate for sure. Um, film by Will Smith was in some film, I think, called Concussion, oh, really? about um, that particular issue. So it, it, it wasn't really seeking out the negative. It's more about the positive or m more about what the artists themselves. You'll see, you'll see um, uh, Nevin Lahart, um, uh, in, in the guise of remote painter, he was he. It, it's a an alter ego painter that he goes under, bringing Shergar into the picture, you know, and uh, and and the demise of of Shergar, um, and uh, to you know to sculpture with Andy Fitz. So it's a real mixture of medium. And, and and as I was saying to Eamon earlier, there 
there were many other things that I would have loved to have brought in, but again, you're confined by space and um, time and accessibility and availability, so um, I do hope you enjoy it when you get to see it. But, but we, you know, we were talking earlier, it's just slightly about, and I suppose it does need to be said that um, sport isn't for everyone, and we do sympathise with the, the kid in the group that doesn't love sport, never wants to play sport, is trying to find their thing as well. So we'd want to celebrate children finding their thing and, um, and not be pushing sport on people because there's many kids in Kilkenny that may not have an interest in hurling that hopefully will find something that will uh, inspire them and, and, and bring richness to their life as well. So we're all kind of aware of that as well. Yeah, well, hopefully. And, and it's wonderful that children are responding to it. They're, 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 they walk, come in and they, they get it right away in one, and even some of the more subtle, complicated aspects of it. So that's really rewarding. We have a question here. Yes, um, it's wonderful to see um, artists acknowledging the importance, the cultural importance of sport, I think. And as a person whose eldest son was born on the 31st of December, <laughs> <laughs> I, I know what you're talking about, but uh, may I say that um, I have a, a, a philosophical problem with the title, because as far as I, uh, it's art, the art of sport. Mm. Now, my definition of sport might be very restricted, and I exclude dance, because one of the requirements, one of the, 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 the requirements of the definition is that sport is competitive, and art uh, is an accidental. Uh, part of sport, if it appears at all. Uh, the language of sport uh, brings in aesthetics all the time. A wonderful goal, the beautiful game, a beautiful shot. But the, the wonderful artists that we've seen in the exhibition are using sport, uh, they're portraying sport. Yeah, yeah. The, the, it's the art of painting, the art of photography. Um, uh, and I'm wondering uh, if there's a question, it's um, do any of you see the um, human movement of sport as art in itself, other than the portrayal of art? And I'd suggest to you that there are situations, gymnastics uh, is a sport, competitive, but there is an aesthetic requirement. Ice skating, similarly. But what about, uh, and again, they don't come under the definition of sport, something like uh, skiing, uh, an athlete, or a a skier comes down a mountainside and leaves a track on the mountainside. And that is, could be an aesthetic uh, in installation. Mm. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's, it can't be portrayed other than through photography, yeah. painting, or something like that. But the sport itself can be uh, the medium. Uh, uh, Does anyone want to answer that? And I'll jump in well, then. Can I just say something else? Support, oh, yeah, uh, we'll say in the Castle Park, the grass grows, we'll say, a foot tall. And someone decides to go out. I'm now going to, uh, by walking, which you could say is a sport, I'm going to make an installation in the grass mm -hmm. of the Castle Park so that when you view this, you see uh, uh, an artistic uh, installation. An intervention, yeah. Um, uh, that's not a go question, ahead. but I, okay. I, I respond, please. All right. <laughs> Just a few things. As the dance person, I'm, I'm just going to say, because I'll leave someone else to do the aesthetics of um, <laughs> an Andy Goldsworthy intervention in a, um, in a landscape. Um, but it's interesting, because if you think back to the Olympics, the original Olympics, and then the yeah. revived Olympics, um, art and sports uh, were part of the games. Um, so it's interesting for us to think about actually what are the distinctions that we think of now because they weren't necessarily part of the same they weren't necessarily divided interestingly dance which isn't taught in school uh, except through the curriculum by PE teachers so it's part of physical mm -hmm. education in the training of this country like if dance appears at all in the curriculum it's through physical education so it's it's interesting that it occupies that um, unusual space. Breakdancing is going to be in the next uh, Olympics, which is going to be interesting. So it's another one of those uh, uh, sp sports, I don't know, uh, practices that's going to be judged on uh, technical skill, but also aesthetics. Um, so, I, I, and it is interesting to think about how much the aesthetic becomes part of our way of appreciating 
exceptional sporting performances. Not always. Paula Radcliffe is not, I don't know anyone knows, Paula Radcliffe is a runner. Um, she's not someone who has a gorgeous running style, um, but yet is one of the most effective, or was in her generation one of the most effective runners. But often it is the beauty of efficiency, of form, all of those sort of things aid physical performance. Um, and we recognize, uh, we, we find that appealing. Is that aesthetics? I'm not sure. But what I guess might make it artistic is the, I think I usually say intention. And if the goal is the goal, or the goal is the speed, or the goal is the height, um, then maybe that's not the same thing as an art. It may have an artistic um, outcome, but if the true goal is the winning, then maybe it's not an artistic Maybe it's not, but I don't know. I'm not. I'm really. I'm not going to like exclude anyone yeah. from art. Come on, all in. Mandy <laughs> or, or Colm, anything in response to that? Well, yeah, I was just going to say. I mean, I think it's uh, what you said is, is very true. Um, there's something that I mean. I think as an artist, is, that's one of the very um, the big appeals to sport as a subject to deal with. I mean, I'm 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 more pictorial, pictorial, but I mean, someone in performance. There's I know there's a lot of artists out there who are working with sports and the gestures of sport, the marks of sports, like all this, like kind of there's a, there's a huge there's so much to work from. Um, yeah, I, that's I'll, yeah. I mean, it's tempting to go into more, uh, but we could be talking here for ages about it. But yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I'll just say one thing, just in terms of. Just that thing between sport and the physical. I mean, I say that I don't play sports, I'm not into sport, but I'm still a very physical person. And the practice that I have at the moment is kind of a walking-based practice. Mm -hmm. And it's very much about me walking in a particular environment, a uh, particular built environment with my camera and responding to the environment. But it's, it's totally based around um, the weather, mm -hmm. sunlight, mm -hmm. how the feeling of the space at that particular time. And sometimes I go out walking like, and I mean last year, three to five times a day, recording the different, just slight shifts in light or, or, or movement in uh, the different buildings that are happening. So it is, so there's a type of meditation in that. So maybe that, like it's a type of physical art practice but it's not competitive um, and it's not sporty, but um, I don't know, that, prob I, that probably doesn't... But um, that's really answer. interesting because that kind of ties up the fact how much three, the three of you overlap. Mm -hmm. You call them in the fact that you actually do practice sport and you're walking and you're, the physicality, the almost performative, like performance art, you know, you're mm -hmm. engaging with what you're seeing and as artists they are capturing through the lens of their art what and translating it for us. Those who don't make art, they're the ones that are capturing it for us and, and uh, having that live on and being able to really um, uh, bring together classical images or um, a wonderful dance um, for us all to enjoy. Ian, did you want to add to that? Well, I'm not sure whether it's adding to that, but it's not a nice piece of synchronicity in that one of the first medals won uh, by the newly independent Ireland was by Jack, was by Jack B. Yeats, who won a medal in the 1924 Olympics for painting. That's oh, nice. that's yeah. a nice oh, that's little that's fact. Um, oh. Sorry, there's a... <laughs> Amazing. That's great. Hi, um, I have a question for Fergus about the <laughs> Abu film. And uh, apologies for getting very specific with the question, um, but as someone that's interested in the material culture of sport and its design history as well, um, I, was, I was really struck by the designs on the jerseys. So I was wondering if you might be able to explain those for us. Well, thank you for noticing those. So I worked with a costume designer called Ella Daly. And so it was, in, why are they like that? All of them are different. Uh, so that was important that even though we were putting together this group, um, that it wasn't a team. So we didn't pick a club color. Um, they are made uh, by cutting up um, a, a variety of different kits and then also screen printing onto them, or uh, transfers. 
and they are images sourced from all kinds of, like each of the dancers and variety of people involved. So in fact, there are, this photograph of my mother um, uh, with me uh, when she was wearing pigtails because she was actually over age, but she wore pigtails so that she could play camogie when she moved to ring. <laughs> um, uh, so there's a photograph of her, look, but they're all kind of mixed um, and all cut. So in a way, the if it has intention, it has intention, mm -hmm. it is that it would be a kind of melt, melting pot or a kind of, so that it's, it's not picking a team and being on one side, it's kind of creating a new, a new sort of kit. And uh, we really liked them and we made several of them that we've kept for ourselves. I gave some to my siblings actually, so. That's great, nice question. Is there another one there? Yeah, we have one at the gentleman at the end. Hi, yeah, it was just to, I suppose, to add to the idea of, uh, you know, competition and physicality in art. One is that if you've ever competed for an open call, you know about competition <laughs> in art. And, you know, galleries are competing for funding, so competition is, can be fierce uh, and bitter in art, I suppose. <laughs> and, 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 yeah. and secondly, just the physicality of, uh, like Mandy, you know, going out with a camera, say, in the, the heat in the summer in France, carrying a 40-pound you know, backpack up a hill to get a photograph, which, when you, you look at it later, is rubbish anyway, and it's you know, in a futile effort. Um, so that's the, the one thing, you know, there is that. And if you talk about choreography and, and dance, you know, uh, that is a very physical thing. You know, there's no way that uh, I could sort of lift a person up in the air and allow them to twirl around mm -hmm. over my head, you know? So it's, you know, I think, Things like that, like gymnastics, they're very physical mm. and I suppose competitive and certainly a athletic in any sort of classical definition of that sense, I think. But what I also wanted to add was just that the points that were coming out earlier on is to do with the idea of outsiders and insiders in art as being somebody, or sorry, not in art, in, in sport, as being somebody who never competed in team sports per se and was never interested in that. And I still actually don't get what you mentioned there, and, and about the the feel good sense of being in in a crowd supporting a team. I I actually just don't get that. I don't know why I don't, but I I don't. Um, so I have run. So I used to do running in school because that way you didn't have to be on a team. You, know, you would be in a running team perhaps, but you running is it's a solitary pursuit. It's your body, and. <laughs> I do a bit of cycling as well, I have done cycling, I'm running at the moment and I've run and combined my running with, um, with photography. In 2018 I did, I ran every day to take a photograph um, so that I could post one per day on Instagram to do a thing which, it's there, I've done nothing with it yet but it is there, I've done that particular mm. work on it. But it's just the whole idea of, of as I said, you know, being separate to say the fervour of GAA in Ireland and you see there's the two mm -hmm. ads that they're running at the mm -hmm. moment about how the, the, the major competition is saying that the, the tagline is, this is major. And then they're doing a paradoxical ad for the minor, and they're talking about this is minor, and then at the end they say, this is major. So is it major or is it minor? It's, <laughs> it's hard to tell. And just the last thing, I suppose, that I'd like to say, just I suppose to share something that I realized about sport during the pandemic is that there is the sort of the Hollywood trope of the, the sporty jocks in the school sort of picking on the arty or computer <laughs> nerds. And the pandemic made me realize that sport is probably the most nerdy upper, you know, pastime ever <laughs> because you've got guys in pubs who debate who would have won this particular competition. They can list countless <laughs> goals on various FA Cups and so on in the same way as Star Trek fans will tell you who did this or that. And then even the Star Trek people will watch reruns because there was no sport. They were doing, they were rerunning old articles in the newspapers mm -hmm. endlessly, Absolutely. watching old films mm -hmm. of sport. And it's just, I mean, that's the most nerdy thing I've ever seen. <laughs> There's an appetite around there, all right, yeah. to be the viewer, to be the observer and not the yeah. participant. I'm sure you've run into this now, Fergus, with... 
individuals are coming to it in different ways and uh, well, with the dance too because in your dance you see individuals away on their own on the pitch and they're expressing something in their movement and that seems to speak volumes well it's interesting when it, if i think about how some of that movement was made um so we spoke to some ca to a some county players in limerick and one of them really kind of a uh, young man who's very emotionally articulate, I would say, but he spoke about, um, he got into sport because it was the way he could communicate with his father who didn't speak to him in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, yes, you can, I can watch that person's performance on a pitch in a particular way and like how well they played and how many points they scored. But I also know, like one of the things that he is doing on the pitch is he is communicating with his father. That's also, as well as winning a match and uh, you know, all of those sort of things. So when we were working with the dancers to generate material, like generate movement, or um, it was with that. With mm -hmm. Sometimes we would look at it formally, we would look at the shapes and the kind of dance, the movements being in the air, all those sort of things. But also looking at what, what else is we, or what, I don't mean what's really, it's all really going on, but like what else that we don't pay attention to is going on. Mm -hmm. So that those moments where the dancers are separate and they, they are being, their movement is generated by other sets of memories, mm -hmm. other relationships mm -hmm. that they bring. And for me, they are all in the, they're all on the pitch. They're all there. They're just sort of the ghosts of them are there or mm -hmm. the references of them are there. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's yeah. when you talk about, and, and I think it's really interesting, I, it, like even working with the dancers, most of them will have, they are dancing, except for one, one, one have played sports at a really high level, but most of them are dancing because they're not doing sports. That was a real choice to, to be a dancer, that, a bit more like my, um, and it's interesting how we give value, we're like, we're sort of a little bit annoyed, resentful about, we'll say, a GAA. But actually, that resentment is absolutely endorsing and giving all of the power. Like, for me, I have no interest in, in, in sort of saying, I, I'm not like promoting the GAA. I'm saying, it's a, it's a cultural phenomenon. I want to be part of it. I want to understand it. I want to use it as a way to help people understand themselves. Mm. That's not the same as like supporting the GAA. It's just recognizing. <clears throat> GA was formed uh, at the, uh, as part of the formation of the national identity in this country when um, Irish people suffering from a trope of imperialism which said that we were wild and incapable of controlling our own bodies, people introduced the GAA as a way to show that we could control our bodies. It has, so we have to think about it, also its relationships to fascism and the control of bodies in those ways. Like there are lots of really interesting histories that we could go into. The point is, what are we going to do with it now? Mm. And mm. That, that's what I'm yeah. doing. Mm. And it's obviously Thank evident you. in the work of all of these artists on the stage, which I hope you will go and check out again and again. It's life experience. It's how we live in the world. And uh, and uh, commend each of you in your work and wish you the very best into the future. And thank you very much for participating today. I think. It turned out to be quite the interesting <laughs> chat where we're going and yeah. um, chat for further conversations, no doubt. So thank you all very much for coming today and enjoy the rest of the festival. Uh, this